Veins are very important because they carry the blood back towards the heart. So that, remember, the towards is the key term here. And they are at the formation when the capillary beds unite in the post-capillary venules, and then they merge into larger veins. And those veins get progressively larger as far as the diameter as they continue back towards the heart. So, these larger venules have one or two layers of smooth muscle, but this is a key difference between veins and arteries. The veins have very little smooth muscle in the tunica media, but the arteries have a significant amount of smooth muscle in their tunica media. Now veins, they are referred to as what we call capacitance vessels. And this means that at any one time, the large majority of our blood, normally five liters or five to six liters, is gonna be found in the veins. So they're the blood reservoirs, if you will. This slide is showing the a micrograph of an artery versus a vein. Now you'll notice on the left that the artery has a very large middle layer. This middle layer that I'm pointing to is called the tunica media, and that tunica media is the smooth muscle that's important for vasoconstriction and then vasodilation. On the vein, on the right side of this diagram, we see a very thin tunica media. So it's only a couple layers of smooth muscle. So you've seen this slide before, but it's good to re-emphasize that the structure of the arteries and the veins are quite different. Now, both have three tunicas. They all have the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. However, the big difference is the lack of smooth muscle in the veins and also the presence of valves. And you'll see here that the post-capillary venule is what leads into the veins. So the relative proportion of blood volume that's found in the various blood vessels is demonstrated on this pie chart. As you can see, the systemic veins have 60% of the blood, it could be a little more, 65% at any one time, but we refer to them again as the capacitance vessels or blood vessels because a large proportion of blood volume is in the veins. And this, may, this should make sense to us now because we know that in the veins, the venous system, there's the lowest pressure. If we look at the systemic arteries and arterioles, we can see the amount of blood is only 15%, and that's because the pressure is much higher. The heart is 8%, where the, where the pressure is really high. Capillary is 5%, where the pressure is really low. So the veins, the in this case, the blood pressure is much lower in the arteries, so the adaptations are necessary to make sure that blood returns to the heart. And when blood returns to the heart, that's called venous return. And the venous return is going to be equal to what's pumped out of the heart every minute. So the other adaptations in the veins are the venous valves. And these are important because they prevent the backflow of blood. And there's also what are called venous sinuses. A sinus is a flattened vein with a very thin wall. One example of this that you've seen is the coronary sinus that's on the posterior side of the heart. Other examples include the dural sinus of the brain. Now this chart you've also seen before, but it's really important to again emphasize the makeup and the difference. We've looked at the arteries before, and you can see again the high amount of smooth muscle, but in the veins, we have very little smooth muscle. There's a little bit more smooth muscle in the, in the veins compared to the venule, but still not as much as the artery. So it's, again, important to remember that the tunica media is very thin in the veins versus that of the arteries. So when we think of valves, 
we often think of varicose veins. A lot of people have varicose veins, and you you uh, are, have seen these before, undoubtedly. But varicose veins are dilated veins, can be very painful veins, and they're due to incompetent or leaky valves. So the term incompetent means that the valve is not doing its job, and it's allowing blood to pool back into a certain area of circulation. So an example of this is prolonged standing in one position can cause it, obesity, pregnancy, and the blood pools in the lower limbs, weakening those valves, and it's very, very, well, it's common in adults, it affects more than 15% of adults. Now this elevated venous pressure, which causes the varicose veins, it can, it can actually cause hemorrhoids. And one way that this can happen is straining to deliver a baby or also having a bowel movement with very high intra-abdominal pressure. This can result in varicosities in the anal veins and that leads to hemorrhoids. Our next slide is on what we refer to as anastomoses. So you should know what anastomoses are. They're interconnections of blood vessels, and many times they'll form automatically as needed. So what they do is they provide alternate pathways, which is a collateral channel, to ensure that there is continuous flow. So one good example of when this happens is when one artery is blocked. If we think of the coronary arteries, when one of those blood vessels are blocked, there's an anastomosis that occurs to make sure blood continues going to the myocardium. So these anastomoses are already present. Uh, they're in many, many places, as we see here, joints, abdominal organs, brain. We also see them in places like the gastrointestinal tract, the palms, for example. And specific examples are the arteriovenous anastomosis, and it connects the arterial system to the venous system, or the venous anastomosis that is going to um, be abundant when veins have blood flow that's blocked. And that's not as common, thankfully. So we're going to talk a little bit now about blood pressure. So there's a few important terms that we first need to understand. The first of those is the blood flow. And the blood flow is the volume of blood that's going through a vessel, an organ, or circulation in any given period. And the way that it's measured is milliliters per minute. And it's equivalent to the cardiac output, which should be five to six liters per minute. If we're not exercising, it gets much higher then. And there's adaptations based on stress, blood pressure, etc. But overall, it's pretty constant when at rest, but again, it can change quite a bit. So, the blood flow is different than the blood pressure. The blood pressure is actually the force that's exerted on that wall of blood pressure by the blood. So, imagine you have this river of water rushing through a tunnel, and it, it is going to exert a force on the blood vessel. And it's measured as uh, systemic arterial blood pressure in arteries, large arteries near the heart. So, for example, in the aorta. And what's important to remember about blood pressure is that it follows a pressure gradient. So, blood flows from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Our next term is going to be the opposition of flow. What is the what we think of as the afterload, the um, peripheral resistance. It's what ha the amount of what has to be overcome, the force that has to be overcome by the blood. And it's measured as the amount of friction that the blood encounters with the vessel walls. And different factors can increase this. Those factors include the thickness of the blood, the blood viscosity, for example, the total blood vessel length, and we literally have miles and miles of blood vessels in our body. 
Now, with each additional pound that we gain, that, that additional mass requires more blood vessels. So that increases the blood vessel length and therefore increasing the peripheral resistance. The last important factor to affect resistance is the diameter of the blood vessel. So um, we need to know a little bit about how that affects the resistance as well. The, so those three terms that we just discussed, the blood vessel or the blood viscosity, that's the thickness or the stickiness of blood. So what's important to remember is that the greater the viscosity, the less easily the molecules can slide past each other. So the bottom line is that increased viscosity equals increased resistance. The next factor is the total blood length, blood vessel length. So the longer the vessel, the greater the resistance that's encountered. And the last example, the last factor that affects resistance is the blood vessel diameter. So in this case, the resistance varies inversely with the fourth power of the vessel radius. Now, you don't need to know necessarily the fourth power and, and that, but what's basically the bottom line is to remember is that when the radius or the basically the diameter of the blood vessel is going to increase, that resistance decreases. So the larger the blood vessel, the less resistance we have. And the opposite is also true. So by decreasing the diameter of the blood vessel, it increases the resistance. It makes it more difficult for the blood to be pumped through that very small blood vessel. So in continuance of that, the small diameter arterioles, remember those are called the, arter the resistance blood vessels, they are major determinants of peripheral resistance. So the radius changes frequently in contrast to large arteries. And here what we have is um, abrupt changes in vessel diameter or obstacles. They can affect resistance. And so what normally should happen in blood vessels is there's very smooth flow of blood. But whenever something interrupts that flow, so a fatty plaque maybe that's stuck on the edge of a blood vessel wall, that causes turbulent flow. It causes the flow to become disturbed. And so in this case, blood pressure rises because of an increase in peripheral resistance. So you should know that both blood pressure and resistance go in the same direction in that if there's more resistance, there's going to be a higher blood pressure.